As we are live, Lord, I ask you to help us with the network, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Okay. So I am today looking at topic nine, and we are going to be talking about foundational doctrine, repentance from dead works. So we are reading our key scripture, which is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not lying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God of the doctrine of baptism, of lying on of the hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. As we look at this awesome topic about repentance, from dead works. There's a couple of things that I just want to lay down. Now, when we children of God, uh, it is so, most of the times you can see that when we talk about children of God, we don't want to think about dead works. But you can see that as a child of God, you can get to a place whereby you get to dead works. Let me give an example. You have received Jesus Christ in your life. And Paul tells the Hebrews that they must make sure that they don't lose the grace that God has given them through Jesus Christ by going back to following, you know what I mean, the things that they came out from. Now, so many times as children of God, we can be saved by the grace of God and then we get to that place again whereby we rectify and we look at the flesh. Now, when we see here Paul talking about repentance, Paul was not actually talking about the repentance of the non-believers. Paul is talking to the children of God and the Hebrews in the Hebrew church that have actually received Jesus Christ and are following Jesus Christ. Paul is telling them to repent from these dead works. And that is what we are going to be looking at. So number one, what is repentance? What is this thing that we talk about that is repentance? Now we can see preached in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 12. We can see here that repentance is not something of just the New Testament. Repentance has even been preached in the Old Testament. Now when we read Isaiah, it says here, and in that day, the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and for mourning, for boldness and for guarding with sackcloth. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 12 to verse 14, also in the Old Testament, we can see here repentance more emphasized by prophet Jeremiah. It says, go and proclaim these words towards the north. Say, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you from a city and two from a family and I'll bring you to Zion. Now, when we look at this, there's something so amazing here about the love of God. The children of Israel have transgressed and defiled themselves, but the merciful God is still calling them. But something that I love about this is that he's telling them, you are married for I am married to you. Even though you have gone and sold yourself, even though you have gone and given sacrifices and worshipped every tree, you know, every green tree, but I am married to you. I will come back to you if you repent. What we see here is that something so amazing is to understand that if we are willing to repent, our God is merciful. He's gracious to forgive us as soon as we run to him. And this in the Old Testament shows us how loving and merciful our God is. Now, we can also see that repentance is not only in the Old Testament. Repentance is also seen in the New Testament. We can see it was also preached by John the Baptist. We can see Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist is calling people and preparing the way for Jesus. But the first message John the Baptist is saying to the people is repent, repent. He's not just calling them, but he's asking them to change their ways 
and repent. And this is what they call uh, preparing a way, clearing a way. You know, it would have been so easy for John the Baptist to have any other message while he was preparing the way for the Son of God. But the message that John the Baptist has is repent. Okay. And it says here, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We can also see Christ himself was able to bring this so important aspect of our spiritual life in place. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What am I trying to say? If Jesus himself can emphasize such a message when he was bringing the gospel, when he was bringing the message, the first thing he talks about is repent. He's echoing what um, John the Baptist is echoing. We can see the same repentance being echoed in the Old Testament. And I believe that it is a sign. And I believe that it is the nature that is being reflected here, the nature of our father. He's a merciful father. He's a loving father. And repentance is something that actually draws us closer to him so what is this the repentance that i'm talking about today what does it mean to repent the word repent comes from the greek word mention which means to change one's mind now i want to say repentance starts in change of mind now when you look here repentance is a firm decision that someone has to make Non compelled, someone has to make that firm decision by themselves in their mind. That is where repentance starts. Repentance starts by, I am, I am making the decision. And then after that, we ask for the grace of God to come. And it's so important to understand that if anything is going to start, there has to be what we call true repentance. We have seen so many times people going in a place of fake repentance, you know, to please man or, you know, something just that is short lived or they didn't really sit down and make a firm decision. When we make a firm decision and repent, I want to tell you something. There will be such a change in someone's life, but that has to start in a person's mind it is a decision that someone actually makes and when we make that decision it means that if i was going north it is a 180 degree turnaround if i was living in the in the ways of the flesh and i have decided a certain way of living and i make a decision that i want to repent of what i've been doing so that the blood of Jesus purifies me, washes me, and so that I am restored by the Holy Spirit back into a full relationship with our Father. Then it is something that I have to start in my mind. And when I make that decision in my mind, remember again, I don't have the power, the full power to make myself walk in the ways of God. When someone makes a decision in their mind that I have decided you know, to repent of my sins. Then when the blood of Jesus comes and washes, the spirit of God comes in and the spirit of God is the enablement. Should I say it is the empowerment unto that person to be able to walk in the ways of God. There is no way that we possess that power. To You might want so much, but you will find yourself still uh, being taken over by the flesh. And until the full spirit of God comes and lives in you and that spirit of God empowers you, then you are able to walk in the right path of God. So repentance also doesn't just end by a decision of mind, but it also goes ahead whereby Jesus sanctifies you and cleanses us and the Holy Spirit comes in and the Holy Spirit empowers you to walk in the ways of God. We have a couple of things that happens or which we call fruit of repentance. As I always say, when we talk about fruit of repentance, a fruit is a result of something. If it is going to be a fruit of repentance, then definitely it is coming from a place whereby the Holy Spirit is filled you. And when the Holy Spirit fills you, you yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
and I want to say this. When we receive Jesus Christ, there has to be a yielding. We have to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit and obey the Holy Spirit. Because if we are not in that position to obey the Holy Spirit, we might listen, but are we obeying the Holy Spirit? Now, when we yield to the voice of the Holy Spirit and we follow in by obedience, we are going to bring forth fruit. And let's quickly look at the fruit of repentance that comes through when we allow not only to repent, but we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work and we yield to that work of repentance. So the first fruit is repentance produces a change of attitude and conduct. Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 11. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. And if we repent as children of God. There has to be a fruit of attitude and conduct. I remember one thing that I will not forget is when I gave my life to Christ and I repented of my sins. And I made a decision that I want to live for him, that I want to follow him, that I want to serve him. I remember the, the closest people who are going to be able to see the closest people are actually the ones who are going to be able to see the attitude and the conduct changing. So during that time, I was at such a time staying with my dad. I was in my first year at the university, of course, my sister. So I had close family members. But I remember when I came back so excited that Saturday, telling them how I've given my life to Christ. I was so excited. Believe me, I was telling everyone. So my dad comes back. I'm telling him what happened. So he looks at me, and I don't know what was happening during that time. But people were so scared about born-again Christians. They thought born-again Christians are these people who are crazy. So he looks at me with concerned eyes. But he knows I'm now an adult, so he can't really stop me from a decision I have made. But let me tell you something. They watched me. They watched every move I made in conduct and character. I remember, I think it was around three to four five months of I had given my life to Christ. I remember him looking at me and saying to me, my short, I don't really fully understand this new faith that you, you have entered in, but I love the way you conduct yourself. I am telling you something. It had just been my first year and I had become wild. First year, first semester, second semester, I was wild. And here I am, I've given my life to Christ and my conduct has changed. The first person who sees it is my dad to the extent that he sees that I'm so more respective of my stepmother and him. And he doesn't see me coming in late. He doesn't see anything that is out of the ordinary uh, as opposed. He sees a new child disciplined and when you repent, there also has to be a change in attitude. In the attitude you were giving towards people, you have repented before God. We have to see the change of attitude towards people. And that is one of the things that have to be evident as fruit when someone repents. Okay, we can see that also when we repent, it produces joy. Psalms 51 verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Now, this is David. And if you can read the backstory of Psalms 51, as we know, David had committed adultery and he had committed a murder. And he writes these Psalms at a time whereby he was repenting after the prophet had come to him. He was repenting before God. But David was able to recognize that through his sin, he had lost the joy of God or of God's salvation. Now, when we repent, we are able to receive such a joy. 
a joy that you cannot explain. When we walk in continual habitual sin, whereby we have failed to repent and turn to the Lord, one thing that this sin takes away, I want to say to you, child of God, is joy. Joy and peace is taken immediately. When you, as a child of God, choose to walk in habitual sin, and choose not to repent and turn from that sin. It can be an addiction, but it is something that we do contrary to the word of God. And let me tell you one sign that you need to turn back to God is you lose peace and you lose the joy of the Lord. Now, remember, the joy of the Lord is our strength. You do not have strength as a child of God without the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord gives us strength in the darkest valleys, in, in, the, in the overflowing waters, in, in the wind as it blows, the storms as they blow and people look at you. They say, how is it that you have not only this inner peace, but you have this joy? Because you know what? I always say it is my strength. I didn't give it to me. The Holy Spirit in me gives me that joy. It is so something that always happens around people who, who are around me. That when I get in such a certain situation just now, a few minutes ago, <laughs> where the internet literally went west, <laughs> you know, it just decides, okay, I will go west. And, um, and my husband is looking at me. My daughter is standing here and we are trying to work on the on Facebook, I don't know what was happening. It was just refusing to catch. And you know what? In the frustration, I just said to laugh. I literally just burst out and started laughing. And I'm like, you know what, devil? You are not going to take my joy. And you are not going to take away what the Lord is doing. Okay. Now, I have seen that I do this a lot. It's not something I force myself, but it is something that the Holy Spirit has given me. When I'm in such a stressful situation, I find the opposite in my life. I find such a joy in me. And let me tell you something, just like the word of God says that, you know what? His joy is our strength. I can testify to it. That joy is my strength. It carries me in no matter what situation comes. I have this joy. I can't explain it. It's there. You know, <laughs> it's not forced. It is always there. And let me tell you something. When that joy starts reducing, I know something is not right. And let me tell you something. Anxiety starts kicking in and I start hearing the warning signs to go back to that quiet place, to go back to that secret place. Because if these fruits start moving away, then something is happening and the Holy Spirit is trying to give you signs about uh, your spirit because the fruit are things like joy that will show forth. Now, definition of dead works. What does dead works mean? Now, dead works is, is man's tendency to trust in his own efforts to bring salvation. When we start trusting in our own efforts, our own works, we are entering into this space of dead works. Just to re-emphasize, we have not been saved by our own good works. No one has been saved because they are so holy and they are good. Good works will never save us. We have been saved by Jesus Christ, by our faith in Jesus Christ, the living son of God. That is how we get saved. And no one can say that I was saved by my good works because the word of God makes it clear. We are not sustained. We don't keep our faith. We don't keep our salvation by good works. No, it is always by faith. We have been given the gift of salvation by faith through Jesus Christ. It starts there and it ends there. Now, the moment we start adding on works, we have just made it now a dead religion. We are now trusting in our works. And I want to say, just like the word of God, it starts to become dead works how do believers practice dead works number one the call of religion doing things out of habit and tradition revelations chapter 2 verse 4 to verse 5 nevertheless i have this 
against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly. Remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. God, we can see here, is talking to a church and is telling them, God is not talking about non-believer or anyone god is talking to the church and is saying to them they must return to their first love now i want ju just to comment about this very important key about religion we practice dead works when we enter into a place of religion whereby we have certain we start putting in place certain practices certain customs i'm gonna give a simple example <laughs> So maybe the last season of your life, maybe last year, the Holy Spirit told you a certain way of praying, a certain strategy. Did you go back and ask the Holy Spirit, or you are still on that one strategy? Because religion is whereby I make something a tradition or a custom. Because you as a child of God, you have to have daily instruction from the Holy Spirit. The moment you are not getting daily instructions from the Holy Spirit, you are slowly entering into a place of religion. Because you know what? The Holy Spirit is always on the move. There is more in him. There's so much more and so much more. And the moment we stay on what we heard him whisper to us last year, or we stay on an instruction he gave us last week, and we didn't go back and become attentive to listen daily to what the Spirit of God is saying, I am saying again, we are slowly entering into a place of dead works and what we call dead religion. We have to daily be attentive to hear the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit as children of God. He might have told you to do something last year. Is he still there where he told you to stay last year? Is he still directing you to do what you are doing the same way you did it last year? Because you know what? The Holy Spirit is always fresh. If he still wants you to do that same thing like you did it last year, he is going to confirm. Let us be in a place whereby we are daily, daily attentive to the Holy Spirit. The difference with the Pentecostal born again Christian, the difference is, and from religion, people who have been stuck in religion is because they got stuck on a certain custom and tradition. Pentecostal, born-again Christian, filled with the Spirit of God. We listen to the yielding and to the direction and to the leading, the daily leading of the Spirit of God. The moment we stop that, we have entered a dead religion. Jesus fought against this with the Pharisees. He fought against this, I am telling you. The Son of God was in front of them, but they were not able to recognize that the Son of God was in front of them. The Word himself was in front of them, but they were not able to recognize that he was in front of them. They went even as far as making sure he's crucified and killed. And we can get as far as that. So children of God, let us understand that the practice of dead work starts from that place of religion. And we ought to be very careful not to fall in these traps. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. There's a form of godliness, but they deny the power. They deny the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They deny the speaking of tongues. They deny healing. They deny, you know what I mean? the working of the Spirit of God. But they kind of have a form of godliness. Okay, another thing that we can see where believers can start practicing dead works is doing things to receive man's recognition. And it can be simple things like fasting, like praying, even giving. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to verse 14. Please go with me. It's a bit of a long passage. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. 
you listen to that. The key thing is they trusted in themselves and they trusted that they were righteous and they despised the others. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithe of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exhausted, will be, sorry, will be exalted. Now, this story is being given by Jesus himself. The son of God is giving this story. The righteous God, the son of God. He had no sin and he, he never had a sin. And he's standing there and he's given us this story whereby someone looks at themselves and believes they are more righteous than others. Now you and I have received this gift by faith through Jesus Christ. And no one is more righteous than the other. We have to run away from doing things for men's recognition. We must clean our motives when we do things. The Bible says here that, you know what, um, who, who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, we will be exalted. Let us have clear, conscious, and clean motives when we do things. We do these things for God, not to be recognized by men. The Bible goes as far as saying, if you do it for the honor of men, the Bible says, then on earth you have received your honor. But you will not receive an honor in heaven. Who wants to miss out receiving honor before the living God on that day? Because the ones here on earth will perish. But when the God Almighty honors you, it cannot be compared to the honor, the perishable crown and the perishable honor of men. Let us do things with the right motives. If we are going to pray, let us not pray or fast to show off. Let us not give to be praised. Yes, you might be recognized. You might be, you know what I mean, thanked, but clear your motive. Let not your motive be all about being recognized and being honored. It is all about giving so that our God can be glorified in heaven. Another way in which we can practice dead works is when we trust in anything other than God and his word. We can trust in our bank balance, job. We can even go higher than trusting and honoring our family above God, our spouses above God, our children above God. There's so many things that we can substitute for the presence of God. Now, when you read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. Let us keep away from idols and when i'm talking about this it is so important to understand that when we look at the old testament and we see people in the old testament who made up and the children of israel you know it was just one of those scriptures and chapters that used to make me you know like really moses has just gone up <laughs> to receive commandments he is up for 40 days he comes down and the children of god had an idol made up already and we look at that we're like ah oh, how bad was this? But let me tell you something. In our generation, we have so many idols. We might not have like a physical idol, you know, mapped out and 
sculptured before us. But we have so many idols that we are replacing a God with. So many idols. I can start with social media. We have so many idols that we have replaced God with. We have taken the place of God and put other things. And then as convenient as it becomes, we bring in God. God is an addition. It must never be like that. God receives the first place in our lives. And everything else must follow. And in that sense, we must also make sure that our behavior follows that God takes the first priority in our lives. So there are some things in our schedule that we need to adjust, change around, because we can already see that these things are taking so much time that you can substitute your time with God for this other activity. I am telling you, child of God, watch out. It is becoming an idol. Slowly it is becoming an idol, exalting our kids above God in a certain way, that we can do anything, anything to switch our kids higher than God, our spouses higher than God. No one must take the place of God. And when we start doing this, we are starting to have dead works. We are starting now to become lukewarm in our hearts and eventually we are going to become cold we must be excited about the things of god and the moment you start seeing look around your passion right now what is those things that you are passionate about that are so higher than god that you can cancel even a fellowship that you need to attend i'm talking i'm not talking about emergencies but these things in your timetable right now are so high on the list. Let us be very careful about idols in our lives. And because the word of God speaks against replacing God with any, any idol. We will suffer the consequences when we bring idols in our lives and we worship them more than God. I love that. Yes, God is a jealous God. I love that. As we finish today. Let us repent from all dead works. We must repent and make sure we don't go back to the old nature. Our old nature that was full of lust, addictions, and so many things of our old nature. Let us remember the grace that we have received through Jesus Christ. Let us remember the mercy of God. And let us embrace the spirit of God is key. If you don't want to enter dead works, spirit of God, the daily instructions of God, having such a tight relationship with the Holy Spirit that you can hear him closely and clearly and you can react fast. And you know what? When you have gone wrong, repent quickly. Be that person that quickly repents. Because let me tell you something, all of us, no one is righteous. When you know you have sinned, be someone that quickly repents and turns around and changes the direction in which you were walking. Father, we want to thank you, O God. We come before you and we ask you to forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we have put idols before us, where we have done things for men to recognize us and to praise us, O God. Forgive us, mighty Lord, where we have entered places of customs and traditions, O God, and forgotten to follow your spirit and follow your spirit, mighty Lord. Today we repent, O oh God. We ask you, mighty Lord, that you will pour your spirit in us, O oh God. You will wash us with the blood of Jesus. Pour your spirit in us, mighty King of glory, and empower us, Holy Spirit, so that we may obey the word of God. May God bless you and keep you and have a blessed week.